look at that, what? like mighty machine. That's Oh, good morning and beloved. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you. Uh, that uh, was a clip of my son. Uh, sorry, I have cheap phones and stuff, but uh, you get the idea. He's excited. Um, Advent is about arrival. It's this Latin word that means arrival or coming. And so Advent is a season of expectation. It's the arrival of someone or something. And so Leland, uh, my son, he was a uh, just a train-loving toddler. Uh, he was just over the moon for anything that had wheels and an engine, uh, but he really, really liked trains. And so one year when he was a toddler, my parents gifted our whole family with um, a pass to see the Polar Express. You actually like get on a train, it's a steam engine, and you ride around. Uh, he didn't care anything about like the characters that are involved in that. All he cared about was the train. And so uh, there's this big buildup. The, the anticipation grows because you're all there at the train station, and like mile away, you hear the horn from this steam engine. And Leland's eyes just light up, and he, he just wants to get further and further. So my dad has him standing on a rail, like basically trying to contain him in his excitement. But I'll just never forget, core memory for me, when that train came around the corner and he could see it for the first time, and he just lost his mind. Like, like my dad is just trying to like hold him back because he just wants to go for it. He's just so ecstatic, and you got to see uh, a part of that there. But he's losing his ever-loving mind because he's excited <laughs> about the arrival of something that he loved. And the thing with, with arrivals is the more significant the arrival, the more difficult the waiting is. Like when you really, really want something and you're waiting for it, it makes it that much harder to sit in the waiting. But it's just building the anticipation, this, this arrival. But it can be so hard. And so I want to start today with a question for you. The question, like, below the question, below that question, and below that question, like, when we get down to the very source in your heart, what are you waiting for? Because we're all in some state of waiting. I just want to ask, if you would go below, if you would slow down for the next 24 hours and really explore what is it that you are waiting for? What are you waiting for? Leland and I uh, both, if I'm honest, we still have a thing for vehicles. I, just, I, love, I love things with wheels and, and all this stuff, but um, we're, we're walking through downtown Tampa recently, and I saw this, um, you know, the, the ramps that are in a spiral fashion, like you're going up in a parking garage and there's a spiral thing. And so I see this, and I, and I immediately think of Cars 2. You've seen Cars 2? Uh, even if you don't have children, you should watch Cars. Come on. <laughs> Shame on you. Uh, Cars 2 um, starts with, like, there's, there's this car that's a secret agent, and he's out on this big boat, and there's this whole crazy car chase and all this stuff. It's explosions and everything a little boy loves. And there's a scene where they're driving, like, really, really fast in a spiral ramp, driving in it. And I, and I see this thing, and I, I look at Leland, and I point to him, and I was like, look, it's just like in the Mater movie. Right? <laughs> yes. You know who Mater is? Yeah. Oh, people. Man. <laughs> Mater, if you don't know, it's Tow Mater. He's a tow truck. He's old. He's rusty, but he's so much fun. He is so, so much fun. He's voice acted by Larry the Cable Guy, if that tells you anything about him. We live in Lake County. Larry the Cable Guy might be your neighbor. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you're introduced to Tow Mater. Um, like, I think this is the first scene that you have with him where um, Lightning McQueen is supposed to be the star of the show. Nonsense. Um, but he wants to win. Um, he's a race car, and he wants to win the Piston Cup. And so someone says that, like, he, he's, he's out to win the Piston Cup. And Tow Mater is taking a sip of something, and he spits his drink out and says, he did what? His cup? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, other, my other favorite um, is he, he has this thing where he says, I'm happier in a tornado in a trailer park. He's like, that's so <laughs> like, But that's this character. Like, the, like the, the whole Cars franchise would be nothing without mater and consequently when i think of anything like a spiraling ramp on a garage all i can think of is the mater movie like i know the entire franchise as the mater movie because it's all about mater for me i mean i so hope that's what christmas is for you with jesus that all the stuff that we get wrapped up into all the things like your schedule's crazy like gotta go here gotta go there gotta get this ready or whatever and i hope like enjoy all that but man i hope every bit of it or if it's the opposite, and you just have a lot of time to sit. And that might bring you to some dark places as you mourn the loss of someone or something. Whatever it is, I hope that every bit of it just makes you think of nothing more than Jesus. 
that it's all about him. Every bit of Christmas, every bit of Advent is about Jesus. He is at the center of it all. He is at the center of the gospel. He's at the center of the universe. He is the one holding all things together. It was made by him, through him, and for him. It's all about Jesus. See him. It's all about him. He is the one you've been waiting for. What is it, the very base of your heart, that you were longing for? It's nothing other than Jesus. He's what you desperately need more than anything else. He's what you actually want more than anything else, if you could be honest with yourself. This is actually our story from the beginning. That God creates us, and he says, it's good. Everything's good. Created all of creation, and it was good. But then his good creation, namely us, the pinnacle of his creation, man, made in his own image to bear the image of God to the world, to subdue the earth, to take dominion, to cultivate culture, to be artistic, to be creative, to lord over things with the Lord himself in glory. And it wasn't enough for us. We rebelled against him. We have this cosmic treason to where we shake our fist at God and say, no, I'll be my own God, thank you. That the argument that convinces us to disobey the command that God gave us to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the argument that convinces us is, well, if you do that, you'll be like God. Oh, the temptation, too strong. The idea that I could be God. Oh. And we do this every day, don't we? That in countless ways, we wake up and decide, I'll be my own God. In countless moments throughout our days, we decide, I'll be my own God. I'll decide. In this pluralistic relative age that we live in where we say, no, truth is subjective. It's, it's what you make it. That is us screaming, no, I'll be my own God. And it's rebellion of cosmic proportions. And there's consequence for that, namely death. The God told us before we rebelled, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And you just imagine the moment as they took a bite and disobedience and rebellion against God that the biological clock started ticking. Something just changed. And the ground starts fighting back and suddenly I'm sweating and this is uncomfortable. And whoa, girl, where are your clothes? Where are my clothes? And I feel shame. That we're all guilty in this. The consequences of our sin leading us to death. And that's not just a physical death, it's also a spiritual death that God is holy and having been defied by his own creation, there's now this fracture in the relationship. That we're now exiled out of Eden, away from the tree of life because we ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and so we've been separated from life who is actually God. God is life. And there's this fracture now, rightly so, because he is just and he is holy and there is due consequence, just consequence for our rebellion. We've been separated from God. And remember, he is the one that we so desperately need and want when we're honest. And in the midst of that, this great rebellion and these terrible consequences, there comes a promise. That as God shows up and he's talking about the consequences, do you see what you have done? And he's telling man and woman what has happened. But he also addresses the serpent, the deceiver, who John identifies as the Satan. And as he's addressing him, he gives us a promise and he says this in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. From that moment, as Eve hears that promise, as Adam hears that promise, that one of Eve's descendants is going to turn this thing around. That yes, that serpent has deceived you and he is the enemy. But one day, one of your kids He's going to crush his head. He's going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush his head. And so we read the rest of Scripture waiting for that one, longing for that one because we feel the weight of our rebellion. We know that we don't measure up. We know there is consequence coming for us, and it's here. And so we're so desperate and waiting and longing for this promise to come about. As you read the rest of Scripture, waiting for that one. Who is the promised one? Who are we waiting for? And the Christmas story, the story of Advent, is the wait is over. He has come. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Waiting for the advent of this promised one. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Uh, this is where it picks up. It says, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. 
after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Remember the promise. Someone's going to turn this around. And this is the one. He will save his people from their sins, from the things that brought about this fractured relationship to where we have been separated from God himself. This is the one who's promised who's going to bring us back. 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. The wait is over. He just sit in that for a moment to know what we celebrate in this season and finds its, its culmination in tomorrow. Historically, we have no idea exactly what day Jesus was born on, but this is the day that we, for centuries now, have said, let's celebrate it this day. The wait is over. He has come. And yet, we are still waiting because he's coming again. But we can wait in this waiting, like my son losing his mind because I want him to come. I so want Jesus to come. And so we say things like the authors of the New Testament to each other, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We long for him to come. Our king is coming back. Let's be ready. But we can wait this day with the assurance of the day that he already came. That we know, we know he has come and he is coming again. The wait is over. The promised one has come. The one who has come to save us. And so I want to explore just three quick questions with you today. Three quick questions. In light of the fact that he has come, in light of his advent, his coming, his arrival, question one, purpose. (laughs) For what reason did he come? For what reason did Jesus come? If this is truly the Son of God, preexistent, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, he has always existed, and yet, He decides in real time and space as we know it to step in and take on human flesh. For what reason? For what reason did he come? What was his purpose? And it's explicit in verse 21. He will save his people from their sins. He came as a direct response to our treason, to our rebellion, to our sin. He came to address it. He came to make things right. That we had no righteousness of our own, but a righteous God would come and his righteousness to make things right for us. He came because you and I are sinners. And I, it's really easy to use Christian nomenclature, like uh, just to, yeah, I'm a sinner. Um, Hunter, I have no idea where you are. It's dark out there. But Hunter's wearing my favorite sweater I've seen this year. And it's like a, a list. And it says, uh, it's the naughty list. It says, you're all naughty. <laughs> Romans 3, 1 and 10. <laughs> like total depravity is real. There is no good in you. There's no good in me. We fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin or the consequence of sin is death. There is nothing we could do to inherit eternal life in and of ourselves. But he came because we are sinners who could do nothing for ourselves. And he knew he could do something about that. And so when you consider, yes, okay, big theological terms, all like, blanket umbrella like we're Christians we're a church like or I'm exploring this like yeah I know you I've heard you guys say it all the time we're sinners like I want you to make that personal and not as like a beat yourself up thing but we need to be honest because like that sinful woman crying and using her own tears to soak the feet of Jesus because she has a reputation everyone in the room is watching her take her hair and wipe the filth from Jesus's feet using her own tears as the water And Jesus tells this quick parable and explains, you know, when your sin is great, your Savior is great. You need to be honest about your sin. And so when you hear that Jesus came because you were a sinner, can you make that personal? Actually, like, name your sin. 
Think about the real reasons that in your own life, Jesus actually came for you because of that. And how mind-blowing to think that he would come, that God the Son would come for Kevin Franklin with all of my arrogance, with my great pride that gets me into so much trouble because I'm so prone to thinking more highly of myself than I ought. He would love me. If pride is what got me into this place in the, the first place, like, you'll be like God. He, and here I am, thousands of years later, still struggling with my pride. And yet every moment of pride where I think a thought that I shouldn't think, Jesus came for that, to save me from that. Like, that's wild. Name your sin. Know that you were a sinner, but make it personal that he came for you. When your sin is great, your Savior is even greater. He came for you. The next question is how? If that's what he came for, if that's the reason he came, was to save us from our sin, then How? How would he save us, his people, from our sins? And you look at his name. It starts in 21, where Joseph is told what he's going to name the child as Jesus. And then in 25, um, it tells us he's born, and they named him Jesus. And Jesus, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but it's, it's a very significant name. It would be closer to Joshua in English, um, but in that day, it's more like Yeshua. And, and it's a collision of two Hebrew terms. The Yah is a reference to Yahweh, or the Lord, all capital letters, as we call it. This is the Lord, and the other word is Shua, is short for salvation. And so you put these words together. The name Yeshua, Jesus, means the Lord is salvation. And so how would Jesus come and save us from our sins? The Lord is salvation. That the one who came is saving us. He is our salvation. He becomes our salvation. This is the great exchange. This is how he has done this. He died for us, and he rose again exchanging places with us so that the righteousness that we do not have on our own, he has and he gives to us at his own expense. This is how he saves us, that the Lord is our salvation. Jesus is our salvation. And then the third question, why? Because you're telling me he came because I'm a sinner and he came to save me from my sin and he did that by becoming my salvation. Why would he do that? Why would God do this? Why did he come to save me? Our vision text as a church, beloved church, comes from 1 John 4, 7 and 9. It says, beloved, let us love one another. But you get to verse 9 and it's, God's love was revealed among us in this way. He sent forth his only son that we could have eternal life through him. This is why he came to show you, so that you could know without a doubt you are loved, that God loves you, that you are loved by God. This is what Christmas, this is what Advent shows us. This is what the scriptures explicitly say. The love of God was revealed or made manifest among us in this way. This is how you know. So when you doubt, am I loved? Does, does this God of all the cosmos, because it feels so ethereal, it feels so abstract, it feels so like I'm just this small thing and like, who am I? And I look at the circumstances of my life and I can't believe, like, there's a loving God who loves me in every question that we don't have a lot of answers to. In every doubt, this is what you can hold to. You look at Christmas. You look at the incarnation of the Son of God. You look at the sending of the Son of God and say, that is how I know I am loved because God sent his Son that I could have eternal life through him. It's in the sending of Son that we know we are loved and love is relational. It's inherently relational. It's personal. Like only persons can love, right? Objects can't love other things or people. People can love. And so what does that tell us about God and why he would come? But yes, he came to save us from our sins. But it wasn't just like, hey, look, I took care of that for you. Like, have a good time. No, it's because he loves us. And the fact that he loves us tells us what? Emmanuel, his other name, God is with us. That he doesn't just love us and say like, hey, I took care of that for you. He loves us and he takes care of that for us. He saves us so that we can be with him. Remember, the ultimate problem with our evil, with our rebellion, the consequence of that was separation, that we've been taken away from God who is life. And he says, no, 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 no. That's not the end of the story. I'm gonna make this right. God himself steps in and says, no, you're mine. You're gonna be with me. 
because I love you. God so loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Why? He loves you and he wants to be with you. I think this is the beauty of this season is to be reminded continually he loves me and he wants to be with me that you are wanted. Like God desires you. How amazing is that? What good news is this? That God wants to be with us and he made it possible because Christmas, yes, it looks at the birth of Jesus, but Jesus never says, hey, 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 guys, remember my birth. Never forget my birth. No, but he emphatically said, remember my death because it wasn't just about him and the beauty, the wonder, the mystery of God the Son putting on human flesh to be fully God and fully man in this hypostatic union. It's this wonderful thing. It's where the God-man is born as a baby in all the trauma of childbirth. If you've ever been in the vicinity of someone giving birth, it's not a clean, pretty thing. It's traumatic. And God enters the world in such a way, utterly dependent on these human parents his own creation, taking care of the creator. Like, this is glorious. It makes no sense, but it's so wonderful. And yet, it's not about that. It's the fact that this child would grow up sinless, that he would not fall short of the glory of God. He would be sinless. He would be obedient. He would submit to the will of the Father and then be the ultimate sacrifice, that he would die that that baby was born to die, to grow up and then die the death that you and I deserve. Because in doing that, what he did was he took all of our sin, all the just consequence for our rebellion, he placed it on himself. And by his stripes, we are healed. He was smitten. He was forsaken. He took our place on the cross. And he gave us his righteousness. This great exchange where God says, you have no righteousness of your own, have mine. And at the cost of his own life, he died. But then glory to God, he didn't stay dead. He rose again victorious over sin and death. On the third day, he came back to life and he holds the keys of death and Hades forevermore. No one goes through that door without him opening it. What a comfort. This is why he came, to show us he loves us, so that he would not just be born, but he would die, and he would rise again, so that we could be with God forever. Emmanuel, God is with us. Again, why? (laughs) Because he loves us. Beloved, he loves us. Advent reminds us that we are loved. This is what it does. Uh, This is week four. The theme of week four in Advent is love. And so as we go into the day of Christmas where we celebrate Christ, We have worked through these themes and we come to this week and I want you to hear a resounding, you are loved. This is what you can know. By the sending of Jesus, we know we are loved. It reminds us and we need reminders. A lot, I need a lot of them, like a whole lot of them. Uh, I can can resonate a lot with Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, He said this, he said, I cannot remember the books I've read any more than the meals I've eaten. Even so, they have made me. I read a lot. And I do not retain much at all. <laughs> but I have to read a lot. Because it's in the same way, like, I eat a lot, too. That's just the thing. I work out a lot so that I can eat a lot. Um, it's not working too good for me anymore. <laughs> but man, I don't remember what I ate for the last 24 hours, to be honest with you. It was a lot. I don't remember what it was. But I know that physiologically, that has made me. <laughs> and in the same way, reading a lot, not remembering a lot, but reading a lot is still shaping me. And so everything you do in this season, as you celebrate tonight, you celebrate tomorrow, I hope that everything, good, bad, and different, whatever it is, I hope it all screams back to you a reminder, you're loved. It's shaping you. Now be intentional about what you do and make sure there are things that are shaping you rightly. Make sure there are things that are reminding you, yes, I am a child of God. He loves me. And I get to live in light of that love. This is why we name the church Beloved Church. Like the Apostle John, incessantly calling people beloved throughout his letters. Like, you just need one greeting, man. It's okay, brother. But he's over and over, beloved, 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 beloved. Because we want you to know, like, if you hear nothing else, you just need to hear, God loves you. You're loved. So even in the way that we address each other, should just be a continual reminder of the gospel. I'm loved by God. I'm loved. You're loved. 
How amazing is this? That God loves us. Man, okay. Let's, let's move forward in that truth. Now we're loved by God. You are beloved. Now there's research that suggests um, the number is between three to five. So for every praise you get, everyone gives you a compliment. You get one compliment, one praise in a day. Ah, oh, man. Ooh. Doesn't mean a lot. You get one negative feedback, one criticism. And what does that do? It just repainted the whole day. They say that for every complaint or criticism, unfavorable comment that you receive, you need three to five, or sometimes they even say up to seven, positive things to counteract that. That's pretty wild. I'm like, how true. Like, five people say really nice things to me, and one person says something bad. What do I remember? A bad thing. Why are we like that? But if you can see everything through the lens of the gospel, to just again resoundingly hear over and over and over in all of creation screaming to the glory of God, hey, you are loved. You are loved. And we groan with creation, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Oh, Lord Jesus, make it so. You are loved. I hope you hear that. I hope tonight and tomorrow you think about it obsessively and incessantly. That God loves me. And that's why I have every reason to celebrate. Oh, what good news. And love and devotion go hand in hand. You do not have love without devotion. We must be devoted to the Lord if we love him. And in the words of Jesus, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Obedience really does matter. If you love him, you will obey him. So let's step into obedience because we love him. Let's love him all the more. Uh, John Stott is a, a late pastor and theologian. He said this. He said, the Christian should resemble a fruit tree, not a Christmas tree. For the gaudy decorations of a Christmas tree are only tied on, whereas fruit grows on a fruit tree. Let's not be a people who tie on a bunch of stuff to look the right way. Let's grow real, genuine fruit. And the only way you do that, John 15, abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So you want to bear fruit? What do you do? You just stay attached to the source. You stay with Jesus. You spend time with Jesus. You let Jesus shape you. Grow fruit for him. Be united with Christ. His power, his provision, but our responsibility and our joyful privilege to do these good things for the glory of God so the world would hear us resounding with all of creation to say there is a God, he is good, he is glorious, and he loves you. So would you love him? Again, our devotion to him is only ever going to be an outgrowth of our love for him. And where does our love for him come from? His love for us. We love him because he first loved us. When you see the love of God for you, your love for him will grow. And so see his love for you. Consider the devotion of a God who says, I love you so much, I will literally love you to death. What glory that we are so loved that at the cost, the infinite cost, the priceless cost of the son of God, an infinite being saying, I lay down my life for you because I love you. And it's a joy for me to do this. You are that loved. <laughs> what is this? It's amazing to think this is what we get to celebrate all of our lives, not just Christmas, but it's good to have these pointed high points to say, man, I'm so loved by God. You are so loved by God. Look at his devotion to us. Yeah, Merry Christmas from God, from all above. We are this loved. Because here's the reality. We are all guilty and deserving of judgment, and that is really bad news. But God loves you. And he's made a way to rescue you by sending his son, Jesus. And this is good news. We're loved. I'm going to pray and ask the band to come up as I pray. But I want to ask, will you believe this? Will you believe that you are actually that loved by God? That he would come and he would live a sinless life and that he would die the death that you and I deserve, nailed to a cross. He would breathe his last, but it wasn't his last because on the third day he came back to life and he is seated on a throne in heaven 
And one day he is coming again to judge this world. And he says, be ready. So let's live a life of love and obedience and devotion to him. Seeing his love, his obedience, his devotion to us. You were loved. Believe it and now share it. Let's pray. God, thank you for this wonderful story, this wonderful news, this good news that we are loved by you. So God, thank you. I can't, a thousand times we couldn't say it enough, but we praise you. Be exalted, Jesus. Would you draw men to yourself? Spirit, would you move in us and through us? Work in this place. Thank you for what we celebrate at Advent. And a Merry Christmas to you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to enter into a time of communion. But as we enter into this time, I'd like to remind you of when our Lord instituted this ordinance for us, this sacrament. If he's gathered in an upper room with his closest friends, knowing that he is about to die, he's very close to his betrayal and his death. And it's, it's the occasion of Passover. And Passover was this annual uh, tradition where they would come together and they would eat this specific meal and they'd have these different songs they would sing and elements to it to basically retell the story of the original Passover. And if you don't know what that is, at one point in history, the Israelites, all the people of God, were living under the enslavement and oppression of the Egyptian pharaoh. And it's bad. And they knew there's no escape for them. They could do nothing to save themselves, to rescue themselves, to get out of this place. There was nothing they could do for themselves. And God raised up a mediator named Moses, someone to go and lead his people out. And so he sends Moses to Pharaoh and Pharaoh is told to let God's people go and Pharaoh refuses and God rains down 10 plagues on the Egyptians and they're awful. Many, many are dying. It's just horrific and yet it is so just and it could have been so much worse but you get to the 10th and final plague and God tells his people, here's the thing, I'm gonna kill the firstborn of every household here. The angel of death is gonna come and strike the firstborn of every household people of God are just as guilty and deserving of judgment as the Egyptians. But God says, I love you in grace. And you don't deserve my love, but I love you. And I've called you my own. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to slaughter a lamb. You're going to take the blood from that lamb and you're going to wipe it over the post of the door. And when the angel of death comes, he'll see that blood that the sacrifice has been made on your behalf. And I'll pass over that house. And you're going to eat this meal ready to run. You're going to cook it in a fast way. And you're going to do this every year to remember the night that I delivered you from this place that you could not deliver yourself from, that you were enslaved. You could do nothing to free yourself, but I will do it for you. And I do this year after year. Wine, remembering blood. And that lamb had to die so that you would not have to die, son judgment was coming for us, but the Lord passed over in mercy and grace. And they would remember this story year after year after year until Jesus sits at a table with his closest friends and he says, this story? Well, here's the reality of that story. I'm the lamb. It's going to be my blood. So you see this wine, you see this cup, and you think of my blood poured out for your forgiveness because Jesus has come to save his people from their sins. And this bread, you take this bread and you break it and you think of my body broken for you because this is your salvation. This is how judgment passes over this house. This is how you know you're loved. It's their story, but it's your story too. This is our story. An Old Testament scholar, Alec Moitier, was asked one day, what the testimony of an Israelite living thousands of years ago under Moses, what it would have sounded like. This is what he said. We were in a foreign land in bondage under the sentence of death, but our mediator, the one who stands between us and God, came to us with the promise of deliverance. We trusted in the promises of God, took shelter under the blood of the lamb, and he led us out. Now we are on the way to the promised land. We are not there yet, of course, but we have the law to guide us, and through blood sacrifice, we also have his presence in our midst. So he will stay with us until we get to our true country, our everlasting home looks up and he says, you know, Christian could say the same thing almost word for word because it was their story and it's our story too. 
we celebrate this at Christmas, remember he came because he loved us to save us from our sins so that we could be with God forever in our true home. It's your story. So Christian, will you examine your heart? Consider this story, that this is our story. We know we're loved, and this is proof. He came and he died. He rose again so that we could be with him forever. Elements are around the room. When you're ready, would you partake? Eat, drink, proclaim the Lord's death until he 